Hello and welcome to the Quiet Light Podcast. I'm Pat Yates sitting in for Joe Valley. Today we have a great episode. If you ever thought about legal issues going on, either starting a business or a current business, where it would relate to Amazon with relation to trademarks, anything like that, we have a conversation today with Paul Raffleson with Raffleson Law, who is really kind of insightful. People out there looking at law stuff need to understand, first of all, when you're going to eventually sell your company, let's say through Quiet Light, you need to have a moat around it. If you have a product, you need to make sure it's trademarked, sure the business name is trademarked. All these things are in place for you to be able to make sure that your business can be optimized from a legal standpoint. Paul himself is uh, at Raffleson Law is a number one go-to law firm for online business facing legal challenges and digital sellers looking for the best deal when exiting their businesses. In 2021, they facilitated 60 plus online business exits for over $238 million in exits. They do a lot of help with relation to closings. They forward a lot of people to quiet light. Paul is also the founder of sellerbasics.com, which can give you monthly legal help on anything you need with e-commerce and also uh, has a business called Online Merchant Guild, which is really cool from a standpoint of legislation going forward in e-commerce if you're trying to look at it. Obviously, this is a great conversation because these legal things, whether it's tax, whether it's trademark, or it's any of those other things, are all really important things in your business. So I'm excited to talk to Paul about this. Again, Paul Raffleson from Raffleson Law. Let's get right to it. Paul, welcome to the Quiet Light Podcast. It's great to have you here today. Hey, it's great to be on on your podcast. This is awesome. We are big fans of your company and (laughs) and we know many of your clients. So uh, no, it's awesome. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. We know that you're kind of in the same space. You send us a lot of referrals. So I think you're going to be really, I'm really excited to talk about this today because I think you cross over in a lot of different things. I mean, people are intimidated by lawyers to begin with. You know, nobody likes you. That's the first thing we no. already know. So it's, uh, but it's always good to at least hear some of the things that are going on in e-commerce. So let's jump right into it. I know you have Rappleson Law, which is your main practice, and you help Amazon sellers from a broad sense of different things that they could come at you with. Explain a little bit of, um, from a high level about, you know, what Raffleson Law does. Sure. So like you said, I built this law firm. I, I spent most of my life as an in-house lawyer. So, you know, I was a lawyer for Microsoft, for Walmart, for General Electric. I never wanted to be in private practice. I was in, but I was also an Amazon seller 20, 20 years ago, I don't know, 18 years ago. I'm trying to remember, trying to do math, but like early, like 03, 04, 05, I was selling on Amazon and other platforms like eBay and app.com. Um, and uh, just kind of wrote a blog post, uh, snowballed into a law practice. And our law practice is designed to do a couple of things. One is to address the fear of lawyers, right? Well, why do you fear lawyers? Because you fear open-ended hourly bills. And so we try to flat rate and do as much as we can on a flat rate basis to kind of take that fear away, upfront pricing when we can. Um, the other thing we do is we really focus on being uh, plugged in on what an e-commerce Amazon seller needs. So we're really, you know, try to be subject matter. Um, I can't use the word experts, but very aware of the subject matter. How about that? Uh, that 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 is troubling most of our clients. So, and that's a blend. It's a hybrid of uh, intellectual property. It's compliance, you know, legal compliance. Um, it's business law. It's tax law. And so we've kind of built our law practice to just kind of be hyper focused on okay, what is it that these this new breed of online businesses, right? I call them the global small businesses of e-commerce. What do they need? And we sort of built our practice to be hyper focused on them from sort of you know we say launch, launch phase, growth phase, exit phase, and of course the repeat phase because most of our clients when they exit, as you right. know, like to start over again and do something else, <laughs> right? They're like take a couple of weeks off and then they're already working on the next brand. If it's not already in the work. I mean, that's really incredible. So at quiet light, we do the same thing. Obviously we, we don't, we don't get someone in, in the very beginning, but we go through the the sale process a lot. Like you, when clients reach out to you, are they more looking at how to prepare? Do they typically come to you ready to sell? If you're looking at that, or do they come in kicking tires, trying to figure out from the legal side, all the things they need to prepare? Yeah. I mean, I think they come to us late most of the time. Usually it's a lot of times they already have a letter of intent in hand. Um, But I, we always encourage people because as you know, like when you go through the closing process, like go through the process of closing a deal, issues pop up. So we're always big advocates of like, come work with us early. Come let's, let's catalog your IP. Let's, let's apply for more trademarks. I mean, gosh, this is something that is a pet peeve of mine. Um, being so heavily focused on exits and in the law side of what I do and having, you know, 
I mean, we're, we're I think we're close to half a billion closed since 2020. Um, which for our little firm, you know, we're not as we're not a huge law firm, right? So I'm, I'm pretty, you know, impressed that number. But what I always say is like like trademarks, a perfect example. Everybody thinks you just got to get one trademark, you know, because that's what Amazon brand registry requires, and then you're done. And it's like, well, no. If you have variations, right? So I say, look, think of the cereal aisle, right? Think of all the cereals that Kellogg's makes, right? Um, there's Rice Krispies, there's Cocoa Krispies, there's uh, Fruit Loops, there's yeah. Apple Jacks. Those are all brands, right? So if you have variations of your product or differing products with different names, like you need to, you should be cataloging that IP. You should be registering because when you go to sell, what are we going to tell the owner? What does the owner expect you to say? I rep and warn that I own this intellectual property, that I have the right. So if you're selling a cereal product called Fruit Loops, Right. And you had no idea that there was a company called Kellogg's out there selling Fruit Loops. You may run into some trouble come exit time when you're like, oh, this is my Spiro ASIN and it's using this branding. And I have no idea whether or not I, I actually can use it because I never checked. Yeah. So there's a lot of, and that's just one example, but there's a lot of reasons why we really would love to work with clients early um, in the process. And and we give them advice. And we, we, we talked them too about choice of broker. And I am a fan of Quiet Light. I'm happy to talk to you what <laughs> I liked about Quiet Light. But it, it's yeah. what I what I find interesting is, is that I feel like Quiet Light's been in the game longer than some of the other brokers that yeah. just kind of popped up. But I and I find that that's really important because you know in the 2020, 2021 market when you had aggregators and it was and you could you could probably almost not that I would recommend this do it yourself and just you know send an email out to 50 aggregators and probably get 50 offers, right? Those days are gone, right? right. Aggregator is like kind of a dirty word right now. Yeah. Um, there's their business model struggles at high interest rates, so the buyers that we're seeing are really a a tribute to your network of who you're connecting with, yeah. right? You're bringing in buyers from all over the place that are just outside of the realm of aggregators. And I feel like a lot of the newer brokers that popped up in the last two years just aren't, they don't have that depth. And so I've been, a, I've been a big fan because I've seen you guys um, close, you know, bring buyers for deals that are just, you know, yeah. really good, you know, and, and, and really, not conventional sometimes in terms of like the type of business. I mean, like I've seen business where I'm like, yeah, you'd have a hard time selling that business to an aggregator. So what do you do? And they don't get a deal. And then they go to you guys and you're like, Oh, here's a buyer, you know? Okay. It's wholesale. That's fine. We have a buyer for that. It's, yeah. it's, I just, I've been really impressed with, with quiet light. So I'm, 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 I'm definitely a fan. I, oh, boy, you I guys appreciate that. It, it, I'm not here to, to, to do that, but I just, I just thought I'd share since we're talking. No, that actually, I love that you're doing that. People out there obviously understand who quiet light is and, Things like this, you know, Paul, are obviously important because I think that one of the biggest differences in Quiet Light and a lot of firms is that, you know, we take sort of a slower process. We have 15 of the smartest people I've ever seen that can work with any business, have either been in this business. You can't find a business that someone at Quiet Light hasn't touched or sold or owned or something. So the depth of information to be able to get people to market is huge. And the trust with buyers is there. I agree with that. So, so. I think so too. Yeah. So Paul, let's, let's jump into the Amazon thing a little bit. I think people get really intimidated about Amazon. You know, I'm one of the people that is sort of an, you know, a seller that is more than frustrated with Amazon from a standpoint of how they treat their sellers, because at yeah. any day your account could be at risk. So tell, tell me a little bit about the kind of clients that come in and what the issues are that they're seeing with Amazon. Maybe people don't realize all the things that could pop up. Yeah, so it's a bevy of issues. So you've got sort of offense and defense, right? Think of it like a football game, right? So you've got offensive issues and defensive issues, right? So, um, you know, to me, defensive issues tend to be ones where you're under attack, right? So you can have issues where your competitors are doing really awful things to you. Um, your competitors are messing with your flat files and causing your, you know, causing your your product to get flagged as something that it shouldn't be. Um you know, there's 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 a ton of fake reviews that pop up on your account that are negative. Um, so you've got that kind of side. Then you've got sort of like kind of the offensive, which is really about your ability to sell and are you complying? Um, you know, Amazon over the last few years, you have to understand, has gone through a transformation. They've always historically, since their inception, have always kind of relied on this idea that they're just a flea market. They're 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 an intermediary party in the transaction. They're neither the buyer nor the seller. They're just the platform. And with that, they've been able to get away with a lot of not being, you know, they've been able to basically, you know, shield themselves from liability 
by making that argument, but the courts have changed their tune. They look at Amazon, they look at the transaction, they look at how much control Amazon has over the transaction. And they're saying, well, Amazon, you really are like a seller in this context. You're, you're one of the sellers, you know, you are a seller. And so that means that if your product, that if a product sold through your platform injures somebody or violates the law, you can be on the hook. So what that's done in the last few years is created a massive um, uh, amount of uh, compliance need in the industry. So we've seen just a ton of people coming to us saying, hey, I've been selling this product for years. Now, all of a sudden, I find out that I might be subject to FDA regulation. I didn't even know what the FDA was until I just found out about this. Can you help? So we deal a lot with those kinds of issues. Um, so compliance is big. Intellectual property on both sides, right? So you've got the offensive side of IP. You've got correct IP. You want to protect it. You want to protect yourself from other sellers stealing your IP. On the flip side, people are accusing you of violating other IP, right? Whether that's valid or not. So... I mean, the issues just kind of go on and on, but those are high level kind of what we deal with. And then there's just sort of the Amazon-ish kind of issues that are just quirky, like related accounts. Like I use this 3PL who serves like 500 other sellers and now I've got a related account suspension. What ha- what the heck, right? So we, it's, it's a real... It's a real smorgasbord of issues. I like that word, smorgasbord. This is probably you know, yeah. I, I agree with that. I think that sometimes until you get into an own, having an Amazon account, you don't realize all the things that can come up because you start looking at account health. You look at all these different things that that people are having to to deal with, making sure they're in compliance with. There's a lot of moving parts, and people need to be watching that. So, so tell me this: when people come in to work with you, do they? Uh, what kind of programs do you have set up? I see that you have a monthly fee. I don't know what that includes. Maybe tell them a little bit about the support yeah. services you get and maybe the value proposition there. Yeah. So uh, we offer, so we have two ways to work with us. We have a law firm that's a full service law firm that's just, you know, provides you that sort of launch, grow, exit, repeat. That's more on the legal side. But what we realized is, you know, Amazon issues, while they're sometimes legal, underlying legal, you know, most of our competition are not lawyers, right? There's a lot of people in the Amazon consulting space that are not lawyers that you know, charge a lot of money for suspensions. You know, I think when people have their account or their ace, their hero ace and go down, you know, they're, they, you get desperate and it's easy to kind of hit you up for five, 10 grand just to say, you know, I know the special people at Amazon or something. That's not what we do. We do it a little different. So what we do is we built a program that sort of mimics insurance. It's not insurance. We don't indemnify your losses. But what we do is we say, look, for a hundred dollars a month, you can join this program. It's it's not a law firm. It's called Seller Basics. And Seller Basics is um, sort of an account health plan. And so, so with that, you know, you can have a checkup. If you need a checkup, there's no charge. Um, so we call it like account health review. Uh, we can just kind of look over your, your account and say, hey, everything looks good. Um, we also cover um, like, consultations with lawyers. So what we've done is we've built a network of lawyers who participate in Seller Basics and basically we facilitate the introduction, get you like a 20 minute consultation in case you have a legal question. But the main thing people love about Seller Basics for the $100 a month price point is that if their ASIN goes down, if their account goes down, right? If they have a major issue, uh, resellers love it because we also cover the IP claims, the pesky IP claims that resellers have to deal with on a oh. daily basis. Sure. Um, we don't charge extra for that. Um, we basically will go to war. We will handle your case. We will take on Amazon and we'll do everything in our power to get your account or ASIN <laughs> reinstated or however fixed, you know, depending on what the issue is. Um, and we don't charge for that. It's just a hundred dollars a month. So, you know, now you have a plan. Now you're running your Amazon business. You're paying hundred dollars a month. You have resources you can use on the way. And you certainly have a plan for what happens if you get suspended, you contact us and we go, we go to work. Right. And we just work on getting your, your account or ASIN back. Um, and that's really the nature of the plan. That's how we, we kind of decide to do it because we just think that the, the industry of charging five or $10,000 for an account suspension is a little much, you know? No, that um, makes sense. So, I mean, uh, you're sometimes, sometimes in that situation, you're adding insult to injury when you're losing revenue and having to spend a lot of money to be able to get out there and do that. It's a great service to be able to make sure they're protected. When people come in to work with you, again, Folks, we're talking with Paul Raffleson with Raffleson Law, talking about Amazon Law. When people come to you, are they already typically in a, a bind? Or are they coming to you? Would you rather them come to you and start having you do an overview so you're proactive? I mean, is, is it a reactive or proactive thing, or is it both? 
It's both. I mean, it's, it's however people, you know, obviously one of the things, you know, in order to have an insurance style, again, we're not an insurance company, but we, we, we definitely borrow from their mathematics, right. Um, to have a program where we can offer, you know, no charge account reinstatement services uh, for hundred dollars a month, we need people to be members before they, the bad thing happens. So it's kind of like that old, you know, old insurance where it's like we have pre-existing fees, right? So if you come to us to spend it, we do have to charge more because we have to protect the value proposition of our membership sure. uh, in Seller Basics. So you can, or if you just don't want to be a part of a membership, you can work with our law firm directly and, and pay the law firm, you know, or you can pay Seller. I mean, it, it, it's sort of a, we have different ways, but the idea is we really think people should be thinking about this stuff, obviously early on. And we think the program is really built. I mean, at a hundred dollars a month, you know, after tax deduction, it's like two bucks a day, you know, it's really not a lot. And we just, you know, I think people should use it more. I think people should take advantage of the consultation, have a conversation about your LLC, have a conversation about, you know, taxes, have a conversation about your IP. Um, you know, we really encourage people to do it. Do they? Not typically. You know, they, they just don't. I think people don't tend to be proactive when it comes to their account health. They tend to be reactive. I do think that's a problem in the industry. I think that's just right. bad business, you know, not to be judgmental, but I'm just saying, like, I think, like, <laughs> you know, you're spending, you know, you've got a business worth, you know, millions of dollars. We know what happens when the, especially with 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 brand owners, we know what happens when, you know, once they hit a certain threshold of, of, of discretionary earnings. Right. You start to see that enterprise value and you start wondering yourself, why, why aren't you taking this more seriously? You know, why, why not be more proactive? Why not protect those trademarks like we talked about earlier on at the beginning? Yeah. Right. Why, why wait till, you know, you're a few weeks out from closing to find out that your buyer is concerned that you may not have the right to use certain trademarks you're using in your business? Well, why not do that proactively? So I'm obviously a big believer in proactive. I think it's a hard message to get out, though. I think it's just, yeah. you know. The nature of human nature, and I'm not—I'm I'm no less guilty of this in my life, right? In other ways, right? We just tend to procrastinate or just kind of focus on, you know, the immediate fires and not the not the tinder that's that's lurking in the back, right? Which is you know the what I, nature. It nature is really up. incredible, Paul, because when you talk about this, the more I think about it, I think the the real barrier to people utilizing a lawyer on a regular basis is. They're expecting they'll send an email, get an hour bill for 500 bucks just for asking a question. And some of these things are very basic. And I think people are very have a tendency not to reach out if they feel like that, you know, it's is an expensive undertaking. But this allows them to say if there's a little thing ticking in their head, like maybe I do need a Canada trademark. Maybe they get to ask you a question of can you do this? I think I think the setup and the way the plan works is incredible. But let's talk a little bit about what happens if let's say someone comes in and they have an account health issue or their pending suspension. And it's not, let's say it falls under your regular plan. What's the process? Do you guys file the claims with Amazon? Do you give the information to the client to do that? How's the process work on the back end? Sure. So you're, you're, you're precisely right. Like, I mean, we are, we're well aware that people don't like surprise bills from lawyers. Uh, we're fully aware that, you know, um, and, and that we built the model appropriately. And, and to address just quickly your point about um, that sort of 15 minute phone call, like it's sort of like the Geico commercial, like 15 minutes can save your business, right? Like, so, you know, 15 minutes can save that's you five, good. whatever, you know, but it, 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 that's sort of the inspiration I had because when I had a lot of, like when I first started, I was doing a lot of sales tax calls and people just were making really terrible mistakes on sales tax. Like they were doing, things to their business that just was not within, you know, they were listening to software companies that were just pushing their own agenda. And it's like, you guys just have no idea. And I'm like, and then they're getting these letters from the government saying, you know, they're like savings. And I'm like, man, if I had just spoken to you for five minutes before you did that, I, I think I could have saved you a world of grief. And so that was the inspiration actually behind the 15 minute consultation is that like a lot of, a lot of fires can be put out before they start. If you just phone a friend, right. Phone a lawyer. Um, and there's no basis for charging because we don't have a retainer agreement with you. It's just a 50 minute phone call. You can take, you can, you know, listen to us. If we say, Hey, this is what you need to do. And it may cost more. That's, you know, that's, between, that, that's a later on that you can decide, but we really do try to resolve a lot with the 15, 20 minute phone calls and enable you to do as much as you can yourself as well. We're not, you know, we're not here to sell you a new LLC or sell you, you know, that's not really the end game. So um, now, as far as what happens, if somebody comes to us and they're a member of the program and they're suspended, I mean, they just go onto our website. There's, they can literally fill out the, there's a portal in Seller Basics. Right. They can go on and they can fill out, tell us what happened, paste any, you know, it'll tell you, you know, paste the 
messaging from Amazon, paste any supporting documents you have. And that just triggers a ticket in our system. And then our team is just on it. And then we're in communication with you, um, going over any questions we have. And then we put the appeal together. And then what we do is we will, we, we don't, we just think it's a better, better practice not to be connected to other people's accounts, especially given, given how related right. account suspensions are out there. So we will provide you with the appeal and we'll tell you, here's who, here's the appeal, submit it to, submit it to, uh, Amazon as an appeal. If that doesn't work, we'll come back with another appeal. If that doesn't work, maybe we send an email to the executive team. If that doesn't work, maybe we figure out um, how to contact Amazon other ways. Um, but we we really try to fight fight really hard. As far you know, we, we we have a lot of channels that we can go through to try to fight for for these for these members who who have these yeah. issues. So they, you know, all uh, that really makes sense. And I know that having done this once, I remember many, many years ago, I don't remember what the issue was that we had, but we had to uh, submit a plan to be able to correct action on Amazon, whatever the issue we had that we were had going on. It's very small, went away. But when I did that, I sort of found out that you really only get one shot at these appeals, or sometimes you get more, but it really needs to be submitted correctly. Like there's a almost a template to how you send this, how you say you're going to be actionable. So Amazon approves it. Tell us a little bit about that. Are people people probably not advised to do something like that on their own because you have the experience of what these people are, what Amazon's going to want to know and can help them navigate that process. Is that correct? Yeah, because a couple of things are always at play here. So I mean, I don't want to go into full fear mode and say you only get one shot. I don't believe that. Well, there's always a way around it. Like if you're in the right, we have our ways to like get the message, we think, to Amazon if you're in the right, right? If you're fully in the wrong, it's a different story. But if, 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 and this is one of the reasons why we always deter people from writing those appeals because we're like, some people have this belief. This is an old sort of folklore um, from back in the day that you have to apologize to Amazon. You always have to admit some guilt or wrong. And, and actually, we don't do that. We do, if, 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 if legitimately, you know, client messed up. Yeah. Then we have to do the whole plan of action. Here's what we're going to do to fix the problem in the future. And here's, you know, here's the mistake, that whole template. But um, we don't default to that. We always look, you know, we look at the messaging that Amazon's saying. Sometimes Amazon's messaging is wrong, right? Like you have to consider the people who are writing it, not always in the U.S., um, maybe not fully familiar with our laws and, and, and sort of are just kind of go off on a tangent. Um, so first thing first is you really have to dissect, you know, di decipher the code. And I think that's something our team is very good at. It's just kind of reading through, reading through the BS because sometimes your suspension statements make no sense. I'll give you a classic right. example we deal with regularly, which is for resellers. Resellers constantly get these, um, intellectual property claims for reselling branded products on Amazon, which Amazon allows. And that's a common mistake that brand owners make is they file these IP counterfeit complaints against genuine resellers, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to use the Amazon's brand registry tools for that purpose. And sometimes when you file an appeal, the, the the response from Amazon will say, you need a letter from the brand authorizing you as an authorized reseller. Gotcha. Well, absolutely, you do not, actually. And in fact, it says in Amazon's intellectual property policy and their seller code of conduct that they don't follow authorized dealer relationships. They don't believe in that. They believe in something called the first sale doctrine, and you're basically the right to resell. Now, that's all up for debate legally, but what isn't up for debate is you can't use Amazon's brand registry tools to file a takedown. And if you have been taken down, what you really need to be focusing on is how are you going to prove to Amazon that your goods are authentic? Because that's really the question here. It has nothing to do with being authorized by the brand. That's just a mistake that Amazon's script is constantly churning out. Um, but what Amazon's really looking for is they're looking for authentic um, invoices. So if you have a, if you have a receipt from Walmart, Great. If you have a receipt from Target, great. If you have a receipt from Bob's House of Liquidations and, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 Bentonville, Arkansas, um, that's not going to be so great because nobody knows who that is. Right. Or in there's right. a big issue. But the idea is, like, I think our team is just given the experience, just really good at deciphering the code that what is Amazon really trying to say, which is why. We don't encourage you to write things because sometimes people, when they write their own appeals, they say things, they make it worse. They say the wrong thing or they submit the wrong invoice and Amazon will come back and they'll say, oh, you submitted this document. This looks fake. And then they they, they call you a fraud. I mean, it's 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 really crazy how how dealing with Amazon can be from time to time. So, you know, I think it is important to have a guide to have somebody help you through the process if you're not experienced, because it's just it's constantly evolving. And unless you're in it every day, like if you're somebody who gets suspended once in a blue moon. Don't think what you learned through you know years ago the last time it happened applies today because it's constantly evolving. So 
what, you know, which is why, again, I think you need to work with professionals who know this stuff and deal with stuff on a day-to-day basis. I, I mean, I 100% agree with that. One of the things that I was thinking about in this, you know, it's so difficult. People have no idea, especially if you're a new Amazon seller, how difficult it can be to stay in compliance with everything that Amazon wants. You know, you start looking at some of these TV shows where people are buying pallets of Amazon stuff that's either been lost or whatever Ooh. sitting there. You have vendors like I, I had. Uh, a year ago, this is no lie in my business. I think I had 170 some orders that people on Seller Fulfilled had gotten labels for that Amazon immediately refunded them and they never shipped it back. We try to get it back, but we can't. There's so many things that people have to navigate. I mean, let me ask this too. So when when you're coming into work, um, you know, with your group, and again, we're talking with Paul Raffleson from Raffleson Law. Do, is it from an M&A standpoint, I always talk about preparation, like the best work you can do to be able to sell your business is probably before you sell your business, because you need to make sure that you have a mode around it, that your trademarks are good, that everything that you're going to do, do you recommend that people come in and do sort of a, a legal update to look at the whole business and say, you need X, Y, and Z for you to be able to sell eventually? Is it good to come in and try to do that work and see where you're at? I, I wholly recommend it. Do people take us up on it? Very rarely. You know, um, you know, I, I we're you know, we're a very busy firm. And so one of the things we don't, con, you know, we, we don't typically do free consultations, but M&A, given the, the, the gravity, you know, this is the most important, you know, transaction of typically of this person's life, right? We, we try to be a little bit more front and friendly because it's a bigger issue than like, you know, we're not going to sit here and have a one hour call about whether or not you need a trademark because a trademark is, you know, we don't, I mean, it's, it's, if we make a hundred dollars on a trademark, it's like, we can't afford, it's just not economical for us to do it that way. It's, it's, you know, we have to charge on the front end for the consultation if you want that or, or however it works, it's just different, but M&A obviously is such a huge thing. So we, we encourage people to, so with that, we encourage people to contact us early. We try to kind of coach that advice. Like, Hey, let's look at your IP. Let's look at your, you know, even your pictures can be a problem, right? Because buyers can get annoyed if you don't have like, you know, if you hired a bunch of folks on Fiverr to make your listing photos and you can't trace any of that IP, like how you own it, that's a problem. Or if you didn't get a doc, you know, and, but it's an easy problem to fix, especially if you're not dealing with it in the middle of the deal, if you deal with it now, how do you fix it? Make new photos, right? Trace, make new photos and do it the right way. Trace your IP or go back and find where those photos came from. Find out what 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 uh, stock photography licenses are used in the making of those photo- photographs that your fiber person used. Things like that, you can easily just take care of. Um, if you're not in a rush to sell, you're not trying to sell this week, right? you have time, you can go ahead and clean that up. Clean up your trademarks, file some copyrights, right? Really, really represent that you own your IP, which is so important in a transaction because as you know, when you're selling your e-commerce business, like IP is all you have, right? It's IP and inventory. That's all there really is to it. So um, I, I obviously, I would encourage people to do stuff like that. I just find, again, I think it goes back to my point. I think just as small business owners and not to their fault, because I'm guilty of this too, we tend to just focus on the fire that is immediately burning in front of us. And again, not the Tinder, like not the Tinder box behind it, right? That may be even worse. You just kind of, right. you know, we just try to put up our, put out our day-to-day fires. And I, I don't fault people for that, but I agree. I think it would be, you know, anyone who's interested in selling your business should be looking to do sort of a reverse audit of their assets and IP and just kind of, and their compliance, making sure that, you know, Hey, let's tackle these issues now. Not, not when you're in the middle of due diligence or, or, or the middle of negotiating terms of a purchase agreement. That's really good. I think that, you know, quiet light, especially our, our philosophy is that, you know, someone comes in ready to sell that day. That's okay. But typically we don't want that. We want them to be three to six months off. We're not out here looking to get listings every single day. What we're trying to do is analyze where the business is for this, the owner and the seller, and where is he going to be able to maximize that value? And sometimes getting the moat around it, talking with Paul about these things. If you're a listener out there thinking about selling, these are things that you need to have done before you come in because you're going to be, it, it'll uh, definitely move things faster. So one other thing that I know that you work on that some sellers are a little intimidated by is sales tax. And I know that's really a big issue for a lot of people around the country. Maybe talk a little bit about how you uh-huh. can help people in, in, in those kinds of compliance. Yeah, sales tax is a tough issue. It's actually gotten a lot easier for Amazon sellers, right? Because as of, I don't know, 2021, I think was, uh, there may have been two states, but like for, for the most part, I think now all the states sales tax that occurs on Amazon is handled by Amazon. So you're kind of off the hook. You don't necessarily need to register in every state, you know. Uh, the way that some of the tax software companies told you that you had to, um, 
And there were a number of other arguments out there besides that that says she didn't. In fact, we won a court case in Pennsylvania uh, around this time last year saying um, that, you know, just the fact that your inventory ends up in an Amazon FBA warehouse doesn't create nexus, which was a big popular topic of 2017, 2018. Right. prior to the Wayfair case. And and so that's an important distinction because that was kind of always our position that, you know, you don't have nexus. So right now what we're seeing in sales tax is the issue is morphing into something called income tax, which we all are familiar with. We pay income tax to the federal government. And depending on what state you live in, you may pay income tax to your state or local co- governments. And so we're seeing a push by states to demand income tax, which is a problem that we're facing. But the other sales tax issue that I think is really affecting people, especially people wanting to sell, is the sales tax issue surrounding your website. So if you're like my typical Amazon client, if my client, you know, it's like, I tend to have clients that are either really, really like, they're either 80% Amazon or they're 80% Shopify. The majority of them are more Amazon and Shopify. Um, I really have 50-50. But um, so like, if you're an Amazon seller, you're doing, I don't know, a couple million dollars a year in sales. And most of that's on Amazon, but maybe you have, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in sales on Shopify. You know, there may be some things we can do to clean you up, but, you know, we're not going to go out and register in all 50 states because your overall exposure is, you know, can be measured, it can be managed. But if you're doing $10 million on Shopify and you're not collecting sales tax, that's going to be a huge issue come sell time. And your buyer is likely going to want you to hold back an insane amount of money. Um, and so we have to think about ways we can clean that up <laughs> going into the sale, which isn't, I'll be honest with you, isn't, it isn't the easiest thing to do, um, yeah. but it, it's an important issue. And unfortunately, what the environment we're in today, where it's so much easier to sell on Amazon versus Shopify, I, I, I have a lot of clients that they direct their Shopify traffic back to Amazon. So like they'll have a Shopify site and you can say, buy it now, but that's just a link back to Amazon. Um, so they, they don't want tax to do, compliance through Amazon instead. They just don't want to deal with it. Yeah, they don't want to yeah. deal with having you know, even though it can be more profitable that that reserve amount that you have to put up for for not collecting sales tax on a larger right. Shopify account can be substantial. Um, and it's it's a big headache for a lot of businesses right now. Still, it's a um, really good point. And for the listeners out there, I can tell you, I've had two or three deals in the last year that all had sales tax issues late. Either it was a release from their state that they were actually in compliance or they had to go back. And even one, we did a carve out uh, of a period of time that they thought that Amazon could come back even on some some fees in a one piece situation. And you need to be prepared for those things and make sure because you, you're right, there could be a significant holdback from your sale for a year or two while you get, you know, make sure that those tax uh, issues don't come down. So another thing that you, you're involved in, I think it's kind of amazing, and I know a lot about it, so I'd love you to explain to listeners, mm-hmm. you know, you talk a little bit about, you know, how, you know, people are going to be given a voice in legislation and how you're trying to get through your online merchant guild. Tell us a little bit about online merchant guild and, and what you're trying to do there. Yeah, so online merchant guild is a, it's a nonprofit, it's not a nonprofit charity, it's a 501c6, so it's a trade association. So think, uh, you know, National Association of Business Brokers, or sure. if that is a th- whatever that is, or you know, it's basically our attempt. It was an attempt that I made about sixty years ago to basically taking my experience from you know GE, Walmart, Microsoft, especially you know in Walmart when I I, I would actually go out and do lobbying. So um, it was part of my part of my deal, and even in GE to some extent um, would have to do a little bit of lobbying. But um, what I'm trying to do is sort of create a voice, a trade association for the e-commerce uh, and Amazon sellers. And um, it's been a, it's been a tough road, but the idea is, you know, we have an organization that you can go to with questions, with concerns um, that can take on challenges. So we've taken on cases. So through the online merchant skill, we've done a few things on behalf of sort of the overall e-commerce community. Um, we were the number one voice in the antitrust uh investigation Amazon. So when when Congress was investigating Amazon's uh, business practices or mistreatment of sellers, um, we submitted resources to the antitrust subcommittee describing various scenarios on Amazon that we felt were unfair based on feedback we got from the seller community. And it turned out that our our resources were the number one cited resource in the report. Um, you know, they relied a lot on what we had to say. And a lot of what we had to say was came straight from the seller. So we were able to take 
the seller's voice and get it directly to Congress so they could hear. In fact, we even had Congress reading some of our emails on, on live TV uh, when they were considering the legislation. Uh, we've challenged court cases regarding the taxes. We charge, we challenge price gouging. Uh, why would we challenge price gouging, you might ask? Uh, am I a fan of price gouging? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a fan of price gouging, but the way the price gouging laws were being applied during the pandemic created a real chilling effect. Um, and we didn't think it was appropriate. We didn't think that it was appropriate for a state to say that, you know, the Amazon seller is responsible for price gouging when they can't set a state price, right? So a price, you know, you might price a hammer. Uh, let's say there's a hurricane in Florida and you know, you're selling a hammer and you live in North Dakota and you're selling a hammer for 20 bucks uh, because, you know, that's the online market price for a hammer in most of the country. And Florida says, hey, we just had a hurricane and our hammers are typically 10 bucks. So you're price gouging. I mean, you see the problem there, right? That person in North Dakota doesn't have the ability to one, set a Florida price or restrict sales to Florida so that they're not in, in, in invading that market. Amazon doesn't give us those tools. So we sort of challenged um, that concept and we're able to get a freeze on price gouging enforcement via Amazon during the pandemic, especially for things like, uh, we had clients who were afraid to sell Nintendo Switches. And we're not talking about masks and PPE. We're, we, we were not even going there. We're talking about, you know, some governments were saying like, you can price gouge steak seasoning. Uh, it was just, it was out of control. And yeah. we just needed to get, and, and we didn't have the control. So we were like, all just sitting ducks. And so we take on that challenge. We take on tax challenges. We want, so we won a court case in Pennsylvania that was really important about giving us a sense of what is nexus when you're an Amazon seller. And it was sort of the first court to say, hey, you know, just, just simply using fulfillment by Amazon is not nexus creating, which is, we think is the right answer because we think like a person can ship a box of goods to Amazon. Like if I ship a box of goods to Amazon in Florida, by the end of the week, I could have inventory spread out across 20 states because that's how Amazon, you know, splits up those 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 parcels across their network of of, of uh, warehouses. So we, we didn't think that was appropriate. So we challenged that. We had another challenge that we lost, uh, but we didn't lose it on technical ground. We didn't lose it for actual merits reasons. We're just we were trying to challenge federal court jurisdiction. We think that some of these tax court cases would be better heard in federal court, given the constitutional nature of the challenge. But we're still getting the courts to try to agree with us. It's not it's, it's a hard case. We knew, but we wanted to try it. Um, and we're slowly sizzling away at that. But, you know, the guild is there it's there to be a voice. I think. Um, I think it needs more mass adoption from the community. I think we need more community leaders speaking out about it, supporting it. I mean, it was never really meant to be me as the the voice for it because actually I, I wanted to be more on the back end just doing the work, the lobbying. You know, we actually one other thing we did, we actually changed the sales tax law. We actually got the law changed and I was in California quite a few times back in 2019, lobbying to get it to make it so that the sales tax collection law would fall on Amazon, not the seller, so we can get out of the burden of collection. Uh, across California and other states as well. So um, so I, I love the program. I think it's important. I think sellers have the potential to be one of those powerful right. lobbies in the country. I mean, if you consider, I always say, like everyone's so afraid of Amazon as the big behemoth, but I'm like, you know, if you take the number of sellers there are in the US, right? And considering that we're all voting, right? We're all voters. Amazon doesn't vote. Uh, we have quite a lot of power if we could consolidate that power and apply it, but it's just been, it's been a, it's been a rough road to get people to kind of see that. And I think it's, I think that's why big corporations win, you know, because they know that, I mean, big corporations is nothing new. This isn't a playbook that I invented. This is an old playbook. Uh, when I was, um, when I was at GE, I remember there was a whole big to do about taxing soda cans, taxing uh, sugary drinks in Illinois. And within five minutes of announcing that as potential legislation, or uh, you had Coke, Pepsi, Jamba Juice, Starbucks, all singing Kumbaya, and they had a coalition together funded with millions to fight that. They called it Can the Tax. Uh, and they did it. You know, they got it taken care of. Um, that's what I'd like to see the Amazon community kind of come together and be able to do. We just haven't done that. And it's concerning because there's a lot of legislation going on. In fact, uh, you know, the FTC has been trying to pass new antitrust legislation that would be more targeted towards Amazon. It sounds like they're still going to proceed with a lawsuit against Amazon, although I don't have a lot of hope that that's going to, and a lot of expectation, I should say, that that's going to do very much. Um, but I think it's just, you know, a lot of a lot of interested parties, like a lot of people feign interest, but they usually have their own agenda. Like, you know, a lot of the 
Amazon, a lot of the groups that attack Amazon's mistreatment of sellers are really about workers' rights in the warehouse. And I'm not saying that's not a viable mission. Right. I'm just saying, but that's not our mission. Our mission is about fair treatment of Amazon sellers, right? So they kind of use our stories as a way to just kind of like pile on the negative against Amazon, but their goal isn't to make it better for us. Um, it's it's their goal is to make it better for the Amazon workers. And so we're so who's really out there representing our interests and so I love the guild. I think we should do more. And I hope, you know, if anyone is ever inspired by listening to this and wants to do more or has experience, you know, let us know. We're always looking for people to take on leadership. That's amazing. So again, we're with Paul Raffleson with Raffleson Law. So Paul, let's let's kind of wrap this up. I mean, I think it's amazing to think about how not only are you being actionable for people in their current Amazon situations, maybe helping them in, in compliance or anything they need, you're also trying to help with legislation, which will form e-commerce for the next year. So I'd encourage everyone to go to the Online Merchant Guild and check that out and maybe get involved in that community. I'm definitely going to do that as well. So is there anything else you know that you would want people to know that, that Raffleson Law does? Or are we pretty much cover most of it? I mean, our goal, Raffleson Law and, and is is – Really, our goal is to be whatever an Amazon seller would ever need, right? I mean, that's that's uh, that's really what we're there for. So, I mean, um, we're, we're here to be your point of contact. Um, and even if it's outside of our, you know, you have something very, very, you know, we can help you, you know, cost manage those those types of things. Because um, we have networks of lawyers that we know and work with, um, similar to Seller Basics, that are subject matter experts. So when it's outside of our depth, we can go and get, we can bring in, yeah, we can bring in the the A team for that type of subject matter and get you that help. So really, no, I mean anything that you're an Amazon seller typically needs help with. That's what our goal is to be. We're we're here to be a one stop shop for the for the e commerce and Amazon sellers out there. That's amazing. So at Quiet Light, we obviously pitch people being prepared to make sure you have a moat, make sure your legal's in line. If you have to work on that, you just hit hit up uh, Raffles and Law. So tell them how they can get in touch with you, Paul. Great. Yeah. So if they want to work with us on the law firm, my email address is really easy. It's paul at ecom.law, E-C-O-M dot L-A-W. I'm old school. I just use email, paul at ecom.law. Um, and if you're interested in being a part of that Seller Basics program that I mentioned, that it's sort of, it's, you know, separate apart from the firm, but it's a cool program for account health protection. Just go to sellerbasics.com and sign up. It's a hundred bucks a month. That's amazing. Man. It's been great having you in, Paul. We, I, I really, I'm amazed at it because I had some ideas about what I thought I was going to learn. I learned a lot today with this. I think I that, that, yeah, uh, you, definitely preparation. And people have no idea how deep some of these things go. So if you're if you're in a position where you need that kind of advice, please reach out and 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 stay in touch with Paul. And again, it was great having you on the Quiet Light Podcast today. Appreciate you joining. Hey, us. It was awesome to be here. Thank you so much.